We've spoken often about the vast eternal plan for which God created the world, and that is to make a dwelling place for himself in the lowest state of existence. And in that way, when even the lowest state of existence becomes part of godliness, becomes not only comfortable to God, but his primary residence, his intimate home, then you have a total oneness where God is everything and everything is God, leaving nothing out, not even the lowest form of existence. Now this lowest form of existence happens to be us. This physical universe in which we live and the physical beings that we are, this is the lowest possible existence. Now, what makes us so low, and how do we know that there can't be an even lower form of existence? So Hasidus explains that low and high is, is certainly not a physical thing. It's not far from heaven or close to heaven, physically. Low and high mean that that which is sensitive to God is close, is high, and that which is insensitive is low. The more, the greater the insensitivity, the further we are from God. The greater the sensitivity, the closer we are to God. And so angels are closer to God than humans because angels are far more sensitive to God's presence. Human beings are less sensitive. Even among human beings, there are those who are more sensitive and there are those who are less sensitive. But of all the possible degrees of insensitivity, the lowest form, the lowest state of insensitivity is to exist in such a state in which we can be completely unaware of God's presence. Not less sensitive, but totally unaware. In fact, unaware to such a degree that we can actually convince ourselves and deeply believe that God is not, is not present, is not here, or simply doesn't exist. If he's not here, then for all practical purposes he doesn't exist. In other words, a creation that God produces, that God creates, that can actually deny having a creator, that is the lowest possible condition and state of creation. Because what would be the next step? What would be one step more insensitive, one degree more insensitive than this? The next step would be that God would create a state of being, God would create creatures, who not only don't sense God, not only can deny God's existence, but a creature who is incapable of sensing God's existence. That would be the next step. And for God to create a creation that is incapable of knowing Him, has no purpose, has no justification, has no reason, and therefore cannot does not, will not exist. So the lowest state is a state in which the created being is capable of denying, but he also has to be capable of discovering. He has to be capable of great insensitivity, but he also has to be capable of sensitivity, and so he has that freedom of choice. But to deny the creation freedom of choice to create a being that is permanently incapable of knowing its creator, there is no justification or purpose for such an existence. Now, in this lowest state of insensitivity, we have not only a denial, not only an indifference, but also an objection. There are people who not only are insensitive to God's will, but are in fact resistant to God's will. 
One of the differences between the animal soul and the Yet Sahara. An animal soul is basically blissfully indifferent, unaware and unconcerned with God's will or God's wishes. The animal soul is obsessed, the animal soul is distracted, the animal soul is busy pursuing pleasure, pursuing happiness. And in this obsession, in this distraction, it really can't be bothered with what God wants or with what God cares about. So there's an indifference. In this indifference, the animal soul can desire sin, can desire what is forbidden. As long as it has pleasure, as long as it offers pleasure, the animal soul desires it. But the animal soul doesn't necessarily insist on doing that which is sinful simply for the enjoyment of the violation. It wants the pleasure. If the pleasure can be had legally, if the pleasure can be had legitimately, that's perfectly okay. If you have to violate the commandment in order to have the pleasure, that's okay too. That's why it's called an animal soul. But the Eight Sahara, when we're being precise in our definitions, the Eight Sahara is not the same as the animal soul. The Eight Sahara has a passion for that which is necessarily sinful. If there's a kosher sandwich and a non-kosher sandwich, and they taste exactly alike, and they cost exactly the same, there is no visible, physical benefit of one over the other, except that one is kosher, one is not. One is permissible, and one is forbidden. The Sahara wants the forbidden. The Sahara wants the non-kosher sandwich. Why? Because it's not kosher because it's forbidden, because it's a sin, because it's a violation. And the pleasure of violating is what the Yetzirah is interested in. So how insensitive, how far can a human being go from its creator? Not only to be unaware, not only to be indifferent, but to actually prefer violating his commandments taking pleasure in the violation. That's the Eight Sahara. So there's not only an indifference, but actually a resistance. I don't want to do what is correct. I want to do what is wrong. I want to do what is, what is forbidden. There's one step lower than that. The Eight Sahara takes pleasure in what is forbidden. The Sahara doesn't have any great pleasure in doing what is correct and what is noble and what is holy and what is good. But the physical body, on some level, is not only insensitive to a mitzvah, to godliness, not only indifferent to a mitzvah, not only takes pleasure in what is forbidden, but can actually experience pain it can be hurting, it can be suffering, physical pain in response to a mitzvah. Doing what is godly can actually hurt. That's how far our senses are from our Creator. That something godly can actually hurt God's creation. Physically hurt. One of the uh, preparations for the giving of the Torah, for the receiving of the Torah, was that all the men had to be circumcised. Now, circumcision has this unique aspect to it, different from all other mitzvahs, and that is that it causes pain. Not only is it a physical inevitability that an operation causes pain, but it is in fact a necessary part of the mitzvah because 
there are physical ways, medical ways, of avoiding the pain, of eliminating the pain, of numbing the child so that it doesn't feel any pain, but that would spoil the mitzvah and halachically is not permitted, except in emergencies and so on. So it is a part of the mitzvah that the body actually feel the pain that this mitzvah brings. And the reason for that, number one, is that every mitzvah has to be performed in a natural state. If you tamper with the natural state, then the mitzvah is not affecting the natural order of the world. And every mitzvah has to affect the physical, the natural condition of, of the world. Like the famous story with the Al Rebbe, who would not say the blessing over the moon, the Kiddush Levana, while the boat that he was in had come to a stop miraculously because the Al Rebbe demanded it. He insisted that the boat driver, the captain, agree to stop the boat and have the boat stop naturally, not miraculously, and only then would he say the prayers. And the reason being, you want to do a mitzvah in a state of natural existence, not in a miraculous state of being, because then the mitzvah is not doing what it's supposed to do in having effect on nature and on creation. So one of the reasons that you're not supposed to interfere with the natural pain that the mitzvah causes is because, like every mitzvah, it has to be performed in the natural state. But here there's an additional element, and that is that part of the purpose of the mitzvah of circumcision is that it introduce godliness even to that level of insensitivity, even to that level of ungodliness that actually hurts from a mitzvah. That level of existence that is so far removed from its creator that what the creator wants actually causes pain to the creation. Even there, even in that unholiest of unholy states, we introduce a mitzvah. God's will is introduced, and even that state of existence is refined and elevated and sensitized and brought closer to godliness. There are, of course, other conditions, other circumstances in which a Jew finds that doing a mitzvah causes him pain. Emotional pain, sometimes even physical pain. And one has to wonder, if it's a mitzvah, and if this is holy, and if this is good, why would it cause pain? How could it cause pain? In most cases, the pain is really not coming from the mitzvah itself, but from something peripheral to the mitzvah. Whether it's a person's bad memories associated with a harsh teacher or a harsh grandparent or community, and it was that harshness and that rejection that is now associated with the mitzvah, and by doing the mitzvah, the pain of that rejection or of that harshness comes back. So it's not the mitzvah, but something associated with the mitzvah that is causing the pain. It could be that a child feels pain because the father is imposing the mitzvah, and it's the breaking of the child's will, forcing the child to behave against his will. That's what's causing the pain, not the tefillin, not the, the tzedakah, not the bracha that the child refuses to make. So in most cases, the pain is not coming from the mitzvah, but from something, something else. A husband and wife, where one of them becomes more observant than the other and imposes certain mitzvahs on the spouse, and that is causing discomfort and pain. 
Again, it is not from the mitzvah itself. So the husband who refuses to keep kosher, who is pained by his wife's insistence on keeping kosher, is not hurting from the kashrut, but is hurting from the change in the relationship. The husband can be hurting because the wife now has a passion that he does not share. So it's not the actual keeping kosher, the changing of the dishes, the separation of meat and milk. That is not what's causing pain. That's godliness. Godliness does not cause a Jew pain. So where is the pain coming from? It's coming from the fact that the husband has lost control over the relationship. His role has changed against his will. He is not central in his wife's thinking anymore. He used to be. Now God has become central. Now he is no longer the master of his own home. He has to keep kosher even if he doesn't want to because someone else is dictating. That's what hurts, not the mitzvah. Because in fact, those mitzvahs that the husband introduced, which were the husband's idea, those mitzvahs don't hurt the husband. They might hurt the wife. The husband might also be pained by the fact that his presence in the family, in the marriage, has now become conditional, or at least he thinks it has. Because just as the wife comes home and says, we must keep kosher, whether you're ready or not, we must keep Shabbos, whether you like it or not, I'm going to go to the mikveh, whether you agree or not, all of this being painful. But above and, all, and beyond all of this, there's also the fact that his acceptance in the family and in the marriage has now become conditional, if God approves. If God should say that this marriage is no longer appropriate because he is not religious enough, the wife would be obligated to leave him. And so his very existence has become conditional and his presence in the family has now become very painful. But it's not the mitzvah. It's not the godliness. It's, it's the interpersonal and the personal status that has now become painful. And parenthetically, should a woman who has become religious, should a man who has become religious, and his spouse or her spouse has not, should they be willing to leave their spouse? If God would come along and say, your husband is not good enough, I don't like him, leave him, should the wife be ready to leave? If God comes to the husband and says, your wife won't cooperate, well then she's not a good Jew, I don't like her, dump her, get rid of her, should he? Now, there are times when a marriage is halachically not acceptable, not kosher. If you find that you're married and the marriage is not, is not according to Torah, and then the marriage has to be dissolved, that's, that's a different question. Then we're not talking about rejecting the husband. We're talking about two perfectly valid human beings who simply should not be married to each other. But if God would come along and say, the marriage is halachically acceptable, but your husband is not, I don't like him, he's not a good Jew, dump him. What would the godly, right and correct thing to do for the wife? Should she be ready to leave or not? Now here we have two stories in Torah that we can possibly draw comparisons to. One is when God comes to Avraham and says, sacrifice your son. In addition to all the other mitzvahs that God expected of Avraham, he also asked him to sacrifice his son, give up his son. And Avraham was ready to do it. Should we derive from that 
that if God comes to a woman and says, I don't like your husband, dump him, that she should be ready to do that, just as Avraham was ready to sacrifice his son. There's another story in Torah. God came to Moshe and said, the Jews have sinned. The Jews are bad. The people are wicked. I've had it with them. Let me destroy them, and we'll start all over again with your children and rebuild the Jewish people from you. Moshe said, if you do that, then erase me from your book. So Moshe resisted. Moshe objected. Should we derive from this that if God comes to a woman and says, I don't like your husband, I want you to get rid of him, that the wife is supposed to say, if he goes, I go. Where he goes, I go. I cannot do this. And when Moshe said this to God, was God annoyed? Was Moshe being disobedient? Was Moshe being rebellious? Was he out of line? We see in that story that God was very pleased. It is the godly thing to do. Even when God is angry at a Jew, we have to defend that Jew. Even when a father is angry at his son, we have to protect that son because that's what the father really wants. So even when the father has a need to punish his son, he wants everybody else to try to protect the son from that very punishment. And he is forever indebted to anyone who does that. In fact, if a king tells his soldier to punish the prince and later finds out that the soldier couldn't do it, refused to do it. The soldier might be punished, disciplined, but the king will be forever indebted to him on a personal level. So when Moshe said, no, I, I can't do this, I can't. I cannot sever my relationship with my people. This pleased God more than if Moshe had been obedient. What about Avraham? When God came to Avraham, he didn't say, I'm upset with your son, he's bad, I want him punished. It was the opposite. God came to Avraham and said, your son Yitzchak is holy. He belongs in heaven, not on earth. So let me take him back to heaven. Here Avraham could not object Avram could not defend Yitzchak because there was nothing to defend against. So if God would come to a man and say, your wife refuses to be religious, well, then she's no good. I've had it with her. Divorce her. Dump her. The husband should say, but I can't. She's my wife. I can't dump her. How will my life be better without her? She's my wife. A woman would say, I can't divorce him, I can't get rid of him, he's my husband. And that would be the right thing to do, because that would be what God really wants to hear. Getting back to the point of circumcision, when a mitzvah causes pain, even if it is the mitzvah itself, and not the peripherals, even if it's not the emotional pain that comes with a change in status or a, a bad memory associated with being forced to do mitzvahs, even if it's the mitzvah itself, the mitzvah should not be rejected. The pain should be rejected. In those cases where there's a bad association, the association needs to be healed, but the mitzvah should be observed. Because in fact, observing the mitzvah is part of the healing. Because when a Jew is living according to the blueprint that God has for his soul and for his body, then it can only make him healthier. It can only make him stronger. And even if there's a need for some time to pass, even if the person needs an adjustment period where he has to get comfortable where he has to adjust his thinking and his feelings in order to be able to do the mitzvah, 
those adjustments are justified and proper because doing the mitzvah is really the only right way to be. So that even those layers, those levels of existence, where there is such a, such a resistance to godliness, to the point where introducing godliness would actually cause pain, even there, when we overcome the pain, when we overcome the fear, and we introduce the mitzvah, the result is a greater degree of health, a greater degree of sensitivity, a greater degree of holiness, and the pain is only temporary, momentary, and it's gone. And that is possible because of the mitzvah of circumcision. Because at a very young age, even that level of insensitivity that is so intense that a mitzvah can actually cause pain, even there the mitzvah is introduced and the pain goes away and the wound heals and the soul is stronger and the Jew is healthier and godliness prevails. And as a result, later on in life, whenever there is a crisis, whenever there is this kind of conflict, this kind of resistance, where there is actually pain from observing mitzvahs, we are not intimidated, we are not derailed. We know that even there, godliness belongs, even there, mitzvahs are appropriate, even there, holiness will prevail, and the pain will be only momentary. The pain is fleeting, the mitzvah is permanent. And that's why before God gave us the Torah, one of the requirements was circumcision. It's not just another mitzvah that we're going to do once we receive the Torah. It was necessary to have the circumcision in advance before receiving the Torah. Possibly, had we not been circumcised in advance, much of Torah would have felt so heavy, would have felt so extreme that it would have caused us pain. And then we would not have accepted the Torah with the joy and with the willingness and the eagerness with which we did, in fact, receive the Torah. And what made us so comfortable with all the demands of Torah? What made us so comfortable with all 613 mitzvahs? Even though they are demanding, the sheer number of it is demanding, that's because we've already overcome that dimension in our existence that resists godliness to the point of feeling pain. That was taken care of by the circumcision prior to receiving the Torah. And the same is true through all of history. We carry our responsibilities joyfully, we carry them enthusiastically because the pain that could have been has already been healed. Godliness has already prevailed. And even there, godliness is true. Even there, godliness shines. <laughs>